You are listening to the Marketing Equation Podcast with Martin Shervington. Hello, everybody. I'm Martin Shervington, and this is the Marketing Equation. And today, I am joined by Stephen Pierce from Dialect Inc. How are you, Stephen? Hello. I'm very well, thank you, Martin. Good. Next. You're in London. I am. I am in London. The weather is fair and reasonable today, which is which is a nice change. How is it compared to, to Kazakhstan, which was the last time I saw you? <laughs> uh, well, it's warmer than Kazakhstan, no question. It was cold. Somebody yeah. somebody should have worn a coat. I think that was me. So let's explain the reason I brought in Kazakhstan because you and I were over there end of two thousand and twenty and fifteen. I can't I can't think two thousand fifteen. Yeah, two thousand fifteen. And I spoke on social media and branding, and you spoke on branding the country. You both speak about branding the country, but you you have a different view to a lot of people. You're a very professional guy. You're a content guy. You you're the editorial. What's the title that you got? Editorial, editorial director. Dialect. Editorial director. Um, but what I mean, apart from the fact that you dress like you know some super cool dude, but you've got. A, a fashion background, and you've got a view of branding which is different to a lot of people. So obviously, because it's it's you and Dialect, a, a super cool company. But what what I want to do is give a people a, a quick overview of what we did there, what you did there, just to put some flesh on the bones, give a bit of context. <clears throat> well, um, you know, as you said, we were, we were asked by the uh, government of Kazakhstan to go over there and do some uh, presentations. Uh, I think they're very interested in. Um, you know, uh, creative views, creative perspectives from the West. So you and I went along and, and did our thing on the on the main stage, which was rather good. Um, I, I talk primarily around around the ideas of of uh, sort of brand storytelling and how they might um, apply to a country. You know, which is a fairly unique marketing challenge. But um, it was it was basically going through. Um, a list of elements that sort of eight elements that I would broadly apply to uh, kind of any brand or, or any any kind of brand storytelling, but applying them on a country wide scale. Um, you know, as you know, because you were there, Astana, the the capital city, is is um, you know incredibly new, incredibly wealthy, um, looks very prestigious, but it's sort of missing something, and I suppose for want of a better word, you know, it's sort of a bit of soul, a bit of personality. And I I found that quite absent. And I think, you know, soul, personality, um, you know, attitude, surprise, all all of those things are absolutely key to to brand storytelling. So I think, you know, applicable, um, you know, on a country and city-wide scale. Beautiful. I couldn't have done it better. That was nice. That was good. So we can either run through, do you want to run through what those eight things are? For people, well, yeah, I mean, I, I can do. I mean, it's just, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a fairly, fairly generic presentation in some respects. But you know, you've got, um, I suppose, if we run through them uh, one at a time, purpose, um, brand purpose. You know, every brand makes a promise. You know, it's well said. You know, and your promise might be to sell chairs, or it might be to sell um, vegetables, or whatever. But, but you know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's more than just the economic um, purpose. It's about your sort of brand, your brand purpose, and what it actually means um, at, at a more, you know, a more emotional level. I suppose the functional purpose is to make money, be commercially viable, keep people in employment. But you could argue the intentional purpose of the of the brand should be, could be, you know, focuses on successes um, that are more uh, evident in 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 making the world. A better place, making people happy, improving the conversation, adding to the conversation in and around your particular space. So, you know, your purpose isn't just to sell the cheapest furniture, it's to provide people from a brand perspective with this sense of, you know, belonging, a commitment to maybe, uh, you know, eco friendly production, that kind of thing. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to let you run through them. I might okay. say something on the way, but no, I, I like listening to you, Stephen. Go on. Okay, so so in the instance of, of of Kazakhstan, you know, when we were over there, if you think about brand purpose, you know, it could be um, obviously to a certain degree, it's about bringing people over to Kazakhstan, uh, getting startups uh, off the ground, um, providing presumably some kind of tax benefits and, and financial benefits, 
But, you know, brand Kazakhstan, if you like, um, needs to be more than that, really, to capture people's imagination. It needs to be something about the geography or the people or, you know, the great culture that's going over there, going on over there and has been for, for, for many, many years. You know, e educational benefits. Something that's got more, um, you know, something more human than just just earning cash, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's helping people connect with that story as well, isn't it? And well, that's what, yeah, I mean, that's the purpose of, of good branding. But I think, you know, at, at, at this, just running through the sort of eight eight points, I think, you know, purpose is, purpose is key and defining your brand's purpose is key um, outside of just keeping people in the job. Yeah, good. Um, now, if anybody's listening to this, which I'm sure you are, if you search for Brand Kazakhstan on YouTube, you'll see that I seeded my presentation on there, so you can you can watch that after you've listened to Stephen's verbal presentation. Okay, number two. Um, yeah, so um, another really important element of brand storytelling is consistency, and, and um, as as you you tend to point out to me, uh, Martin, you know, yeah, I do have an interest and in, and in, in something of a background in in, in fashion, and um, I used as my example when we were over in brand Kazakhstan, uh, over in brand Kazakhstan, over in Kazakhstan. Uh, an example of consistency was uh, the brand Comme des Garçons, which is um, a Japanese brand with a French name. Many listeners may be familiar with it. It's quite high-end, quite avant-garde. But their approach to marketing you know, has, has an enormous amount of parallels um, with how we might market anything. Um, but it's, I just find on a personal level that you know, rolling out in presentations Coca-Cola or Apple or, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I find it a little bit tired and a bit sort of, it's well-trodden ground. And there's a, there's a lot of, um, I think, a lot more interesting brands that do things differently but still create the feeling of belonging and desire and, 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 and that great brand purpose and attitude that all the best brands do. And Comedy Girl Sign is a brilliant example of that. Well, let's give a quick story. So we, so you trotted that out, and I think that was probably on the Thursday our presentations, and then on the Friday we're meeting with all the tech guys, and somebody wears a what do you call those things? Like a pullover? It was a, it was a, it was a, a cardigan. Comme des garçons play cardigan. There yeah. you go. Okay. So, but he wore that because you talked about it the day before, and he wanted to let you know, and he was he was letting you know that that was why he was wearing it as well. But the point is that that perpetuated then a story and you two were then oh look at what clothes you've got your nice gucci jacket and so on the amount of times i heard the word that's a what was it that's a a, a, a piece which is cool. <laughs> but a but, piece. <laughs> but suddenly what happened was that you fashionistas if that's the right way of putting it suddenly there's three of you all kind of going oh, that's cool that's great and, mm. and that came from you seeding the fact that you were into obviously fashion but, but the day before you were talking about you know a, a different example that's what you're saying as opposed to trotting out the usuals but suddenly you get this little micro community form when you find you've got people in common with you so i think part of what you're saying is from the brand storytelling is that you, you tell the story and then they find you yeah i think just take go for yes i, I was making a real point no, point but yeah so it's a, absolutely <clears throat> i i just find that i mean my interest obviously i you know i've got a huge interest in branding and technology and video games and all that kind of good stuff. But I'm also, like a lot of uh, certainly guys of my age and a lot of girls of my age, you know, interested in fashion, interested in popular culture, music, uh, museums, uh, modern art, silly weird furniture that challenges the conventions of what a chair should be. And I, I, <clears throat> I suppose modernity, basically. I'm fascinated by modernity. And <clears throat> I think I think when you uh, it, you know particularly at a convention where everybody's talking about technology and brands and all that kind of stuff, when you tap into something that uh, that that is one of their more sort of inward passions, something they didn't expect to talk about at a yeah. marketing convention, then yeah, you're absolutely right. You start people start coming out of the woodwork and go, oh yeah, I like that band or I like that you know brand of jacket or whatever. Um, and great bonds are formed that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, people that, you know. Um, and, and that's exactly how content marketing works, exactly. Um, you know, you tell people things that surprise them, make them feel part of a community, and they want to share and, and say, well, I like that too, and this is why I like it. And that's what great um, content marketing does. And it's interesting, it's not necessarily as predictable as people think, in a way. And you've got to listen, haven't you, as well. You've got to take that feedback, and then the, the story, the conversation continues. It's, it isn't just about pumping out the piece of content. 
you know, you write in that game you think it's actually about the community then doing something with it. So, I mean, we'll move on to the others, but what about community contribution in, in terms of brand? No, I mean, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, you know, really the, the um, you know, the, the ideal function of, of content, um, marketing content, is to provoke interest, provoke some kind of action. Um, you know, that's the, every piece of content that we produce at Dialect is, is about trying to promote, uh, provoke an action. Now, you know, the obvious action that the, the, our client may wish is for somebody to go and buy something, and that's fair enough. But sort of almost equally as important is things like commenting, sharing, responding with their own experiences, adding to the communication. Um, it shows very directly that X or Y piece of content is valuable and useful. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's provoked interest and been a, a re, you know, a, a good part of the conversation. And I think that, I think that content marketing content, in other words, what a lot of people might consider to be, you know, inverted commas sponsored content or something like that can and should do this just because something is sponsored. It doesn't mean that it shouldn't be valuable or provocative in some way. It still needs to serve the people that are paying attention. Absolutely, yeah. and it needs to it needs to do more than um, just say X or Y product is coming out. You know that isn't, to my mind, content marketing. I mean that's just sort of it's straight promotion. Place, really, you know, it's a yeah. written advert. Um, it needs to do something else. You need to think about the why, where, now, who, where stuff. It needs to sort of you know why is this of interest to you? What have you done before that you, you've enjoyed that makes us think this is pertinent information for you? And all that kind of good stuff. Um, and and present it. It's all about execution. Um, it, it's you know there's more people with ideas than anything else. It's about good execution. If you don't execute something well, even a good idea, it won't it won't fly. It won't take off. It's got to be well executed for the market, um, for the audience specifically. Um, and that's difficult. That's really difficult to do. I mean, your background, you were future, weren't you? You were future publishing as well as, yeah. as, as other people in the team. Because, you know, you've, you've been magazines. That was the, the, the precursor to, to doing yeah. the content marketing on, on the web. So you saw the industry change. And ultimately, you've got to serve the community's interests. Otherwise, they stop buying. They stop paying attention. They remove the app whatever it may be. Yeah. And I think a lot of people miss that with content because they just go, we've got to put something out, you know, and, and, and so often about us. But the, the thing I was going to pick up on, Stephen, was around, before we get to that, number number three, is, <laughs> is that a lot of businesses, a lot of big businesses, are now able to look at the attribution and, and how much value is actually created directly. And I know for smaller businesses, it's hard because you go, well, you put the blog post out, got lots of visitors, et cetera. But actually using goals and using analytics and you know, potentially remarketing to people and, and, and if you've got email addresses, doing something which is funnel-based, you can measure. You can actually look at what the value is of a piece of content. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a completely different um, game these days. I mean, you know, certainly you mentioned print, you know, you, 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 very, very difficult to measure other than the amount of people who have bought the magazine, you know, how many people have conceivably seen the advert and possibly acted on it, impossible to say. Um, the, the way we work, obviously, in producing, um, you know, editorial content, social content, rich media content, <clears throat> all sorts, um, everything is measured. Um, through multiple KPIs, so you know it's 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 the content has to earn its keep. Yeah. And if it doesn't, then uh, we do it differently. We try yeah. something else. Yeah. It's as simple as that. If people, if you've got a store and you're selling apples or oranges, and everybody's buying oranges, and nobody's buying apples. Maybe next time you order, don't buy so many apples. It's as simple as that. It really is. Um. So so yeah, I mean that's the beauty of it, and I think. I think a lot of editorial people who have managed to transition into the digital space found that that hurdle of um, uh, of measurement of success of, of the measurement of success around the content they produce potentially a little disheartening initially because in the magazine space you kind of were the master of your own destiny and you produced this product. And hopefully it sold quite well. And if you were like me working on an official PlayStation magazine or something that was, you know, had an enormous amount of demand at the time, it was going to sell kind of anyway, uh, in a way, because it was a Sony, you know, uh, product. 
Um, there was a huge fan base for for, for uh, PlayStation. And everything that we wrote and everything that we said in the magazine, we thought we were geniuses, you know, because we were selling so many copies. We thought, well, you know, we wouldn't sell as much if we weren't writing this funny stuff. Uh, the truth of the matter is it probably would have, um, in my view. Um, but online, there's nowhere to hide. If you write something and socialize it and it doesn't get picked up, it's just not interesting to anybody. Mm -hmm. So you better change your approach. It's been democratized, really, hasn't it? Atten attention now, it, you know, people vote with their attention. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, absolutely, which is why I, I, you know, I mention execution as being so important. There's an awful lot of rubbish content on the yeah. internet, and the good stuff floats to the top, and that's okay. It's just that the professionals have to prove that they can play in that, in, on that playing field. You know, they can produce stuff that is going to, um, you know, not necessarily go enormously globally viral every time, but at least speak to the customers that you want to speak to. Yeah. Cool. What's the next on your list? Um, well, we've talked about consistency. Uh, blimey, there's eight of these, Martin. I know. Is it through? Um, authenticity is important. I, I kind of have come to start hating authenticity a little bit because it's, it's, um, it's such a buzzword from sort of organic loaves to shoes made in Northampton by artisans to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, everything has to have this sort of story these days. And I know I'm in the business of brand storytelling, but it, it, it's almost become like, you know, the, one of the preeminent sort of uh, notions of our time, really, this idea that everything has to have some kind of heritage and legacy and to be authentic. But, um, you know, it doesn't have to be about people we your suit jacket in 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 Tibet you know it, it it's um uh, we we uh, did some work with GoPro and uh, analyzed their brand for a while and you know GoPro it, their brand authenticity isn't about you know organic muffins made out of sticks you know this is this is uh, a brand that is um about adventure and action and jumping off cliffs and going further than anybody else and deep sea diving and, and filming these incredible experiences and and it's and it's a different type of authenticity it's an authenticity that's shared by an enormous group of people globally um who are um you know obsessed with with uh this sort of extreme sports world um and so what gopro have very smartly done is you know obviously they're a, a tech company but uh, initially producing cameras but they've also become a sort of social company because they've created this incredible platform that where people share all their stuff but there's a real authenticity to it and and i think you know to work with gopro you've got to really get into the mindset of the people who are posting and sharing their experiences which isn't necessarily yeah. easy to do you know but if you look at a, a brand that's built a community around them i mean nike have done the same thing adidas and you know others have, have got into that running space but gopro has have, people buy their unit so that they can go and have the experience that they can then share back to the community because they're part of it you know they want to show that lifestyle they want to you know it's it, it's i think it's an exceptional story mm. aside from where the sales go yeah. but from a community base it, 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 it's it's brilliant it's a brilliant example of of this yeah. sort of of some of, of you know everybody knows a few people that go surfing or a few people go climbing and all this but this idea of pulling everybody together skateboarders bmx guys climbers surfers deep sea divers etc um just by this shared appreciation of i guess extremes is is quite something well i think it's, it, it's almost philosophical if you take a step back and i think a lot of businesses can't they won't necessarily get this because they'll still be thinking they're selling cameras yeah you know I mean? it's a shift to you you're selling the experience the camera the thing that you've got is the vehicle to that but it's almost scary not to talk in terms of features and not to compare you with the latest nikon or the latest 360 you know that's just come out because you think that people want features but actually it's what you can do with it we know it's the benefit but the benefit is now social for yeah. so many people but of course, I mean, without wishing to mention Apple, Apple have done that with the iPhone, right? I mean, you you know, I don't compare the features of the iPhone with anything else. I just want the next iPhone, um, and that and that sort of. But it, but it, they haven't done community as well, and no, that's no, one no. of the things. Is it, I, I agree from a feature. I think they've given passion, and people love the brand. I mean, I'm on a, I'm on a Mac now. It's wonderful, but I, I they've never brought me into their ecosystem, and the closest you get is a podcast. 
which is you, you may vote, but actually even that isn't there. They, they're not a social... But Guy Kawasaki said it, they're, they're not a social business. You know, they haven't done that yet. No. So I think that that's something, again, which is like, if you're online, there's an opportunity for people to allow other people to spread the word. And okay, you know, I think a lot of people do spread the word every time they pull their iPhone out. So maybe it's social in the real world. But it's not... I, I think for a small business, you can't do that. And for a medium business, you know, so it's how do you create, I, I always thought, how do you create the first hundred evangelists, mm. you know, for products? Anyway, this is your podcast, not me. Anyway, next one. Well, it, I mean, it, it segues very neatly into, into number four. As if I knew. Um, which is emotion and belonging. Um, yeah. Which is, which is that sort of basic psychological need uh, humans have to feel connected to others, you know, bonds of affection and relationships and stuff. And, and one of the examples, of course, which is... Um, that I used was, was, was Harley Davidson. You know, it's this example of a, of a prestige product like, yeah. like Apple, um, which is, I guess to my point about the phones is, uh, you know, it's, it's not so much, I guess, a social thing in that, in the, in the digital sense, but, um, but no, but you're right. It's in the real world. And it's the same with yeah. the hogs uh, is that the, the club is in the real world. Custom, yeah, customers yeah. aren't always rational. You know, I am. It, you could argue it's irrational for me to want a Comme des Garcons jacket that costs a thousand pounds, that that looks like it's uh, that looks like I found it in a in a dustbin. You know, but but that's <laughs> but that's the that's the design ethos aesthetic that you you buy into. Similarly, you could buy a motorbike, arguably as good as a Harley Davidson. You know, technically speaking. Or a phone as good as an Apple phone, technically speaking, but it wouldn't be an Apple, it wouldn't be a Harley. So, so that sense yeah. of emotion and belonging, the fact that both you and I are Apple guys. I'm not. Do you know what? I've got a Samsung, Samsung S6, yeah. love it, but I am on a, I'm on a Mac. But point, you didn't know that. You obviously, I, I hid it from you. I really should conclude the podcast at this point. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, emotion and belonging, very, very important. Um, you know, and from a brand perspective, you know, you need to think about how to give customers peace of mind, how to make customers feel like part of the family, part of the club. How, you know, do you as a brand make customers' yeah. lives easier? Um, number five, flexibility, very important. Um, and this is and this is sort of uh, relevant to. So you've defined your brand. You know what your logo looks like. You know how you're going to speak to people. You know where you're going to disseminate your messages. But then things change. You know. Uh, Twitter becomes less important in the dissemination of social uh, messaging and X or Y platform becomes, you know, WhatsApp becomes more important. So how do you, you know, move, how, how do you transition onto these platforms and how do you start targeting customers anew um, using, you know, different, different uh, content mechanisms? Um, it's just about, it's about moving with the times, basically. And, and I think, you know, certainly over the last sort of 100 years, that there's never been more, there's never been a period more uh, likely to change on the whims sort of month by month, year by year than over the last sort of, you know, 10, 20 years. Um, particularly the last five years is ridiculous. I mean, there's new platforms, new opportunities, new ways of, of, um, of, of disseminating content. Um, my my girlfriend at the moment it was uh, she works at she's working at London Fashion Week. Just to point out, not that you're looking at changing her, uh, that, that you are actually getting no. married. You, not your girlfriend at the moment. Your girlfriend, comma at the moment. You just had to, a little pause in there, Stephen. Oh, my girlfriend at the moment. Oh, I see. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. She's not going to be able to listen to this. Now. She's not. That's, she's not right. that's not what I meant. But I. Um, <laughs> In, you know, it's interesting to me that she is she is working at London Fashion Week at the moment, doing uh, Insta, working on the Instagram account of, mm. of various different brands using Boomerang, the app Boomerang. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with that, yeah. but you know, takes five shots and then you know, and and this is you know, on mass these shots. Are, and admittedly, London Fashion Week is a wonderful place to take shots because loads of beautiful people, interesting colours, interesting clothes. But you know, the on mass this sort of this Instagram feed of, of, of constantly moving, vibrant images, you know, it's fabulous. And mm. yet, I don't wish to belittle her job, but very, very easy to do if you're in the right place. But it's wonderful. It's wonderful stuff and so attention-grabbing. And, you know, it, it's perhaps obvious that the fashion industry would be up to speed with things like that. But the applications for other, other verticals is enormous, you know. Yeah. And it is storytelling. As you said, that's just using the, 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 the tech to, instead of just taking the photo and putting it in a magazine and, you know, it takes a month, it, it's, it's, people are included in it. 
yeah. those those that are there and those that aren't there. They're just little snippets of, yeah. of of stuff. But but you know, if you think about London Fashion Week, I suppose it's a place that a lot of people would like to be but can't be. So so sort of showing um, real time sort of uh, image uh, moments, you know, from from this straight to their mobiles, you know, is is fantastic. And the application to do things like that, at obviously big film events or trade shows, and all that, is huge. Some people are doing it already. A lot of people aren't, you know. Um, anyway, uh, number six, employees as ambassadors. Uh, I mean, I'm a huge advocate of this. Um, I mean, this is this is more of a, a this this ties into making the brand feel like a family, which extends yeah. to making your customers feel like part of that family. Um, you know, some companies do it really well, some some less so. The example I had was Zappos, who, you know, the shoe company in, in the US, I don't know if they're available in the UK, but um, it's, uh, you know, they put their, cust- their um, service people front and centre, you know, they have images of them, they have podcasts by them they talk about uh, you know the insights department and they and and uh, putting co- uh, company culture right to the front and uh, you know putting it on equal par with profit um, it's just fantastic stuff you know uh, how, how you know how true some of this stuff is I have no idea this is what I've read and it's how the company illustrates itself and and I, I really like that and I think whether your business is big or small that's something you can do um, because people buy from people. People like people. And, and um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a big, big, big fan of that. Um, another, the, uh, number seven on the, on the brand building um, list is reward your customers' love. Um, you know, this is something that's often overlooked. I know from my experience in working in publishing and working with, um, uh, working with you know, myriad clients, Let's do a competition. Yes, fine. Who's going to handle all of the entrants? Who's going to fish out the winner? Who's going to post the prize? All of these sort of seemingly arduous back-end things have often, in my experience, been put forward as examples where we shouldn't do things like competitions or giveaways or opportunities for people to come to film sets or to look around the office where a game's being developed or but but actually, you know, customers love that stuff. Mm. Um, I love that stuff. It, you know, it doesn't even have to be a competition. It's just, you know, these days it's reaching out through social, thanking people for their order, giving them ten percent off the next order, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it, it's, it's relational, isn't it? I mean, it's just moved from that transactional mentality that you're behind a closed door and you take the money and you deliver the thing through, you know, uh, uh, the, through the factory to the shop to the, you know, and suddenly it's different. And I think that the view that you've got is very mobile as well because you're producing so many apps and so much content in apps. So yeah. I was going to drill down a little bit in that. Is it, How do you think that works in a, on, on a mobile platform? Um, I, I think it works on any platform. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I suppose, I don't think in, I don't think, Martin. I don't, I don't, <laughs> That's it, right, number eight. Yeah. No, but, so you don't think there's any difference? But in terms of connecting with the consumer, I mean, they're out and about. In, what I was really thinking, I mean, I do uh, AdWords work, and I yeah. look at where are they receiving the messages, right? So say somebody's in a store uh, or in a coffee shop, I, mean, I just look at the mentality of how they are, Receiving it because I'm I, gamification for brands. So you're in a coffee shop, engaging people when they're there, talking you know that, or when you're in a store, engaging them when they're there. And you can do that through ads, or you could do that through the app, or you could do that. But it could be concerts, and it could. Be, and I'm just looking at how mobile allows people to be instantly connected in a physical environment. That's what I was getting I, at. I think. I think that uh, well i mean a bunch of people are doing that already you know there's there's like the stores that the sort of locational stuff where um it, you know if you if you're signed up as a as a member of let's say x store you, and you are locationally caught within half an hour away from the store it will say hey get down to the store now for 50 percent off this jacket which we know you like because You've been looking at it three times on our website. Yeah. You know, it, well, exactly. No, but I think the thing is, you know that. I know that. A lot of people don't necessarily realise there's, there's some of that, that you can do that. It's not. It's not blown up yet. No. I think. I think more so even than that. Although that's got a long way to go. I'm. I'm kind of interested. You mentioned concerts. I'm. I'm kind of interested in not just location, 
but sort of, um, I don't even know how to put this, moment in time. So if I've been to a concert, if I've been to see a film, if I've been to see a film, when I come out of that film, you know it's that moment where you and I go and see a film and we come out and we go, oh, what do you think? So the first thing you say is, what do you think? Well, I quite liked it. I thought it was a sound so, so. I was a bit disappointed with blah, 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 blah. Now that is a perfect opportunity. So it's something everybody does. We go and have a pint or we go and have some dinner and we talk about it or whatever. Or on the way home we're talking about it. It's the perfect opportunity to provide customers with extra contextual information about how the film was made, who's in it, what they've been in before, you know, what other people thought about the film socially, yeah? All I, I, I know where you're going with this. Yeah, I'm, cool. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking cinemas would like this, wouldn't they? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's just it's those moments yeah. in time where, traditionally speaking, everybody's always come out of cinema and talked about. That is a time. Now, I am possibly less interested in what uh, Deadpool's like now, right, when I'm talking to you. You know, I might be within five foot of a cinema and I might be conducting this chat with you on a, on a cell phone, but I don't really want to be disturbed at this particular point in time yeah. by, by a cinema saying, go and see Deadpool because your mate says it's good. I, I just think there's a step further that we will get to where we're talking about, you know, the, the emotional feelings and, and the moments when people are ready to receive and when it's best to to message them or contact them in some way because you're more likely to get, um, a positive response. I agree, and I think that that map is still, as you said, it's still being built out. Yes. You know, and also then you start to look at the cost for that attention, then driving the action and loyalty, and then you can, you know, if somebody, if somebody downloads the app, you can be sending a notification that then says, hey, you got, you know, a, a two for one on the on the Wednesday or what have you, but if they haven't got the app, then you're then using adverts, you know, and it's kind of, it's understanding all of the options to ultimately connect with people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's yeah. one of the things everybody, everybody, okay, so notifications or email newsletters, how often do we send them? How often do we send them? I don't know of anybody that's ever come up with the, the, the absolute correct amount yet. Well, is one a week too much? Is Maybe we should, you know. It's sort of, uh, it, I think that, that very idea will become preposterous over the next five years because we'll have, we'll have smarter tools that yeah. enable, uh, you know, because... I might. I am a customer who may appreciate having five emails a week from a particular shop. Yeah. You might not. You might want one a month. So you know, how do we know that? Um, but just going back to loyalty, just real quick, because uh, the last one's boring. It's just competitive awareness. <laughs> um, I I shop uh, in a shop in um, in Belfast called the Bureau, which I love. It's a menswear shop. And after buying a few bits from there, and they're, they're, they're um, you know, only, only a few here and there, they emailed me out the blue, and I could have got this on, obviously, my uh, mobile device or the laptop, it doesn't really matter, and said, uh, for your continued to support, we will offer you 10% off in perpetuity on full price items. So a loyalty, a card, essentially. I mean, it's basically a loyalty card. Yeah. I received it digitally. Yeah, I kept that information in my emails so I never forget the code, and it has resulted in many repeat purchases. Yeah, uh, they made you feel special. It made me feel special. It makes yeah. me feel like part of that cool club, and uh, that makes me feel very happy. Anyway, yeah, number eight: competitive awareness. Be aware of what your competitors are doing, and, and try not to copy them. Find your own route. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but this is uh, this was part of a. A presentation but it's it's very true you know everybody just i was talking to i was talking to john my boss uh for for listeners uh, the other day and i i asked him because this is a bit like competitive awareness this is a bit relational i said i'm going to write an article for linkedin you know and just circulate it about isn't it how many people find it really annoying when their boss just sends them a link to something without context with no context or what I find really irritating. Um, are we doing this? We should be doing this. Or something like this. Something like that. And I am positive that hundreds of thousands of, of people working in the media, in the creative space, get emails like that on a daily basis and have to, have to sift through them. But that is, that's a result of competitive awareness. That is a result of John, quite rightly, seeing something of interest and wanting to pass it on. Um, I just think, from a communication perspective, sending things without context is, can, can be a little bit, uh, 
a little bit galling, but there you go. I look forward to seeing that article. Oh, I haven't read, and I have told John I'm going to write. <laughs> Let's circle back round before we wrap up to brand in a country. Because we we we've gone through, you've given lots of examples, and we've got down to the local level as well for for business owners that are looking at that. Let's just come back to the brand in the country. What? Where where would you go next with that? Because obviously yeah, we're, we're we're still talking with them about branding as it's done. But but where would you go? I mean, what would you do as part of a process so that maybe people can take away some tips thinking about their own business? Is is how do you take that list and start working with it? Well, I mean, with Kazakhstan as, as an example, I yeah. mean, it's, a, it's an enormous it's an enormous proposition. Um, I think that. I think that the the sort of starting point actually would be something a bit smaller, um, in, and that is the expo. Yeah, which is Kazakhstan are having an expo, which is the Energy Expo twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen, yeah, yeah. Um, which is very interesting. And and you and I both met some some very interesting people who were over in Kazakhstan who were working in that space. So all about renewable, clean energy, um, and. And the interesting thing is for me and is uh, that on the one hand, you've got this very, for want of a better term, sort of hip, um, conscious, very um, sexy theme, renewable energy. Everybody's interested in that. Everybody's interested in the idea of you know, uh, wind turbines and ultimately being able to share energy, which is a, which is a fascinating uh, sort of almost side discussion but the idea that um that at the moment we are we understand we understand the concept of sharing digitally and by that i mean i can share text images uh, music tracks and video etc but how does sharing move into the real world well you know it's been suggested to me um that you know with the with the advent of much cheaper um solar panels that conceivably um, we could be the uh, individuals uh, uh, can become the um, can become their own you know uh, energy creator. Um, so much better. So if you, sorry, I'm, I'm waffling here. If you think about how um, solar back when it was introduced, the solar panels were very expensive and now they're very cheap. They also weren't very effective. Now they're a lot more effective per square inch kind of thing. So conceivably, you could afford as an individual to cover your house in these things and pull enough energy to power your house, right? So we're getting to that point. Not only that, your house could be built out of them in the first place rather than all the bricks and mortar and all that stuff. But there you go. Um, and then the idea follows that it isn't just about me powering my house. It's about, it's about a community of people who can share energy. If you don't have so much, I can just give you some. I could sell you some. I could just give you some. And this is where sort of real world sharing is becoming so very interesting to mm. me. Um, anyway, I've gone off on a right turn. No, so I think that's, I think what we're saying. Is, I mean, I, I threw a question at you about branding Kazakhstan, and I think what you're saying is, you know, the way to eat a, an elephant is one bite at a time. And I think no, that's. I, I, yes, sorry, I, I went off on. So, no, so I'll pull you back. The way, brand, right. the way to brand Kazakhstan is, is as I said, the, the think about the expo first, and then you've got this very sexy, eco-friendly um, subject. The the, the renewable energy but you've got it in a place that's got stan at the end of it um which for a lot of people is a bit of a turn off even though they don't have know any better and you and i learned a lot about kazakhstan going over there and we learned primarily that it isn't one of the bad stans and it's it's, it's pretty okay broadly speaking um but they do have they <laughs> But they do have a massive hurdle to, to overcome. And it's the perception. It's a brand perception, isn't it? And I think what, 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 what we'll do, not that there's anything wrong with the other stands. Stephen said that. They're all lovely. And what I saw is that the, the alignment with renewable energy is a branding decision. It's an expense. Was it a couple of billion it's going to cost for the expert? So it's, what they're doing is what a company can do, what an individual can do, which is you align with the things that are going to get attention to reflect upon your value system, really. It's saying, we are like this. And I think if I look at influencer marketing, that's kind of how that works as well. You know, you go and spend time with the people that you want to be seen to be like. Say influencer market, or, you know, connecting with influencers. So, yeah, they, they, so they, Sorry, sorry, go on, Martin. Yeah, it's all right. I was on. just going to say, they've got this, 
this sexy subject matter, mm. one that's very appealing to Europe and the West already. Lots of young people who are you know, aspirant developers or aspirant entrepreneurs, passionate about this. So, so the commodity they have, they're going to do a big expo about it. Um, they just need to, like you say, market and reposition Kazakhstan in the minds of potential attendees and investors. Um, and, and how I would go about that is something you'd have to pay me for, Martin. There you go. And on that note, and I'm not sure if it's two billion, it may be too much, but we might have to check out the fact that Stephen Pierce, where can everybody find you? Oh, you can find us at uh, dialectinc.com. There you go. Um, and Stephen at dialectinc.com. PH. Stephen PH. Oh, yeah, Stephen with a PH, yes. Everyone yes. knows. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Any last thoughts, comments, tips, advice? For everybody. Not really, now you put me on the spot, Martin. No, <laughs> the subject matters we've been discussing are really quite, quite, um, quite, quite high level. I think. Um, I mean, I, what did I say at the Kazakhstan thing? Um, I suppose. I suppose it's just that, in my my experience, um, I I think it's a good time to be a creative, and creatives often get um, or are perceived to have short thrift in in that they. Uh, traditionally don't get paid that much or they have to struggle to survive as a freelancer or whatever. Actually, you know, ideas are worth something as long as you handle them and don't give them away too, too easily. Because we're living in a time right now where um, ad blindness and people sort of, you know, ads are too small, you don't notice them, ads are too big, they get irritating, they're, they're, they get in your way, you want to close them down. People don't respond to ads. The numbers on ad uses online are just dropping off. Um, it it feels to me like their time is is running out, and people connect, in my experience, with stories, information, content, great content, be it rich media, be it written, be it you know that's the way to communicate with people, and that's the way that brands should communicate with people now online. Um, there's no question in my mind that that's the, that is the case. Perfect. Everybody, that was Stephen Pierce from dialectinc.com. This is Martin Shermton, and that was The Marketing Equation. See you, or you can hear. Is that what you... Yeah. I always get it wrong. Was that, see you next time, because I'm on video, because everyone else is listening on the podcast, you see, Stephen. So they won't see us. I get it. I get it. You get it, yeah? I say it each time. Anyway, take care. <laughs> see you all soon. Thank you for listening to the Marketing Equation Podcast. Brought to you by plusyourbusiness.com and effective.fm.